Thank you very much for the kind introduction and uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great honor. And thank all of you for coming because I know at six o'clock you all have a debate to watch. So <laughs> I pr got promised to, to, to uh, stop at five. Um, so I'm not actually going to talk about quantum computing all that much. So maybe this will be a relief to some of you, I don't know. Uh, but I will start by, so quantum computing is really kind of the motivation for the thing that I'm talking about. So let, let me start by telling you uh, what a quantum computer is, okay? So a classical computer, as you know, has a classical memory, which consists of a number of bits, and the bits are individually addressable. So there's like the fifth bit and the seventh bit. And then the basic operations of a classical computer are basically to read and write from this memory and then to perform logic gates such as AND and OR, you know, and NOT. Um, we think of a quantum computer <coughs> as being more similar to a classical memory chip than to a classical computer in the sense that it's going to be just, a quantum computer is actually going to be, let's say, in this idealized world, just a device that's attached to your classical computer. And on this device, there is some number of quantum bits, also known as qubits, okay? So I won't tell you very much about what they are, but they are also individually addressable. So there's qubit zero, qubit one. But instead of reading and writing, we have a different kind of uh, basic operations that we can perform on these quantum operations, uh, quantum bits. And the basic operations are unitary transformations and measurement, okay? So you imagine you have your classical computer, and then you send instructions to the quantum device such as apply unit trans, you know, apply such and such unitary transformation to qubit number five or measure qubit number seven. Okay, so these so these instructions that you send, they are also known as uh, uh, we also call them gates, sort of by analogy <laughs> with what happens in in classical computing. Now I will not tell you a lot about quantum mechanics at all, but when you think of a single qubit. For the purposes of this talk, you can visualize it as the spin of a particle, okay? So even if you don't know any physics, the spin of a particle is just a vector in three-dimensional space. You could, if you want, you could imagine the particle rotating around an axis, or otherwise it's just, just a vector, okay? So you can have spin up or spin down, or spin can also point in any other direction in three-dimensional space, okay? And a unitary transformation in that case corresponds to a rotation of three-dimensional space. For example, take the whole space and rotate it by 90 degrees, you know, about the z-axis. That would map this vector pointing in this direction to some other vector pointing in some other direction. So you basically just rotate these, these qubits around uh, quite literally, okay? So in classical computing, we have classical gates, which are things like and, or, and not, and we build circuits from them. Um, the circuits have inputs and outputs, which are classical bits. And um, even though you only have AND, OR, and NOT given, more complex Boolean operations can be implemented in terms of these gates. So you can, in fact, implement any Boolean function in terms of AND, OR, and NOT gates. Um, that's the completeness of the, of the gate set for classical computing. In quantum computing, the quantum computer manipulates qubits, it also has a certain finite set of built-in gates, okay? I just told you that a unitary operation is some arbitrary rotation of three-dimensional space, and in principle, there's not just finitely many of those, or even just infinitely many of those. There's actually uncountably many different uh, such rotations, okay? Nevertheless, <laughs> any practical quantum computer that someone will actually build will have a finite set of specific uh, rotations that are sort of built into the quantum computer. This might be rotations about you know, certain fixed angles, for example. And these will then be called the gates of the quantum computing. And um, many people believe that when a quantum computer will be built, there will be a particular gate set built in. That's the so-called Clifford plus T gate set. Um, uh, that's just a heuristic statement because you, know, you, could, you could use any sort of finite set of gates. Um, but uh, well, not quite any, but you can use many different finite sets of gates. But there's good reasons to believe that this Clifford plus T gate set is actually going to be it, okay? So when you start designing your quantum software, you might as well assume that, that that's true. And, and the reason that many people believe this has to do with quantum error correction. So it turns out in the physics, in the actual particles, 
it's pretty easy to perform some arbitrary rotation by some arbitrary angle because uh, uh, these things are done via laser pulses. Okay, so you, you, have, you have your qubit somewhere uh, sitting in whatever physics it's embedded in and then you send some kind of laser pulse at it and, and the length of the pulse is going to determine by what angle you've rotated your qubit. So in the physics everything is continuous because you can continuously vary the length of these pulses. But it turns out that physical qubits are incredibly noisy. Okay, so they need to be error corrected. If you don't, er if you don't error correct them constantly, then after a few operations, you're just going to have noise and the actual state of your qubit is going to be lost. And, this er and it turns out that this error correction, uh, which is, th the actual error correction that you do is similar to sort of classical error correction, like in the Shannon sense, okay? So there is a way, I'm not <coughs> going to tell you how, but there is a way of measuring the noise without measuring the underlying state and then you can sort of correct for the noise without destroying the actual information. And people know how to do that for the Clifford plus T gate set. So, but they don't know how to do it really for any of the other gate sets. So there is a procedure by which you can take a single physical, by which you can take a logical qubit and represent it in the physics by, for example, seven physical qubits, okay? So you build in a bunch of redundancy. And then, and then uh, there's a way of encoding you know, a single qubit into a combined state of the seven, and there's a way of decoding it back into a single <coughs> state. But when you are in the seven qubit state, there's a way to do the error correction. And it turns out that for these Clifford plus T gates, to perform, it, what's in particular true, there's a sub, I'm gonna tell you what these gates are in the next slide, but th there's a subset of them called the Clifford gates. And they're very important because they're transversal in the error correction. Okay, that means if you want to perform a Clifford gate on the encoded qubit, then you perform the same Clifford gate on each of the seven individual code bits separately. Okay? This sort of thing works in classical codes only with negation, typically, that you negate the code word by negating each bit in the code word. In the quantum world, this works for all of these Clifford gates, um, but they, and, and then the T gate is not a Clifford gate, but people know how to perform a T gate as well. So that's, we can take that as a sort of axiom that the Clifford plus T gate is, is you know, probably going to be built in. Um, in this talk, we will only focus on a single qubit. So I'm not going to tell you what a state of two or more qubits is or what the gates on those ones are. But on the single qubits, the, you know, let me tell you the names of the gates, okay? There is a Clifford gate called H, there's a Clifford gate called S, and then there is this T gate, okay? And um, the best way to explain what they do is geometrically. I already told you that they correspond to uh, rotations in, uh, in three-dimensional space. So here is a cube, okay? I put the uh, UC Berkeley logo on it, okay? So you can see that I was especially prepared just for you guys. Um, let's, so, you know, Space has some axes. Let's say the, the z-axis points up. This front here is the x-axis and the y-axis is the, the green, in the middle of the green face, okay? So now I can rotate this cube, for example, by 180 degrees, okay? These Clifford gates that I was just telling you about actually correspond to symmetries of this cube. So the s-gate is a 90-degree rotation about the z-axis. This was an s-gate, s, 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 s. S to the fourth is equal to the identity, so if you perform the S gate four times, that corresponds to four 90, 90 degree rotations. The H gate is a 180 degree rotation about this point here, which is the point halfway between the X axis and the Z axis. So that is the H gate. It just swaps the yellow and the white faces, okay? Of course, if you can rotate about the Z axis, and you can also swap the yellow and the white faces, then you can also rotate by 90 degrees about the x-axis. How can I make a 90 degree rotation about the white face? Well, I'm gonna answer my own question. So you just put the white face where the yellow face was, then you do a 90 degree rotation, and then you rotate it back, okay? So in other words, uh, HSH is a 90 degree rotation about the white face, and then there's another way you can also do 90 degree rotations about, about, the, um, about the blue face as well. It's also some combination of S and H, okay? Now this is the Clifford group on a single qubit. And as you can see, it's finite. 
It only has exactly 24 elements because these are the 24 rotations of the cube, okay? You can write H S H S S H S H S H, but it's always going to be one of these 24 rotations in the end. Let me see if I can actually fix the cube uh, back to its original position. This is a game my children like to play with this little app. Um, so, because this is a finite, uh, a finite group generated by these gates, obviously it's not dense, right? I mean, there exist some rotations of three-dimensional space that are not, you know, one of these 24. Um, so that's the reason that we have to add one more non-Clifford gate, and th it's the T gate that we're adding. So what does this T gate do? T is actually a square root of S. So T is a 45-degree rotation about the z-axis. So a 45 degree, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that's an eighth root of unity, right? It's a, a t to the eighth is equal to the identity. Now, now we're also going to allow, by the same trick as before, if I combine, if I do, for example, h t h, then I have a 45 degree rotation about the white face, and if I do <coughs> s h t h s s s, then I get a 45 degree rotation about the green face. So let's give ourselves these, th these 45 degrees. So let's call them. Let's call these actually. Tz for rotation about the z-axis, T sub x for rotation about the x-axis, and T sub y for rotation about the y-axis. Now when you combine all of these together, it's no longer a finite group. In fact, if you do T, T sub x, y, z, z, y, x, you know, and a few T inverses and so on, as a matter of fact, this is now, this group generated by H, S, and T is dense in all of the rotations of space. You can get arbitrarily close to any place just by performing sequences of these particular 45 degree rotations about these particular axes. And it's not difficult to see why it stems. In fact, let's go back to the identity. If you just perform something like, uh, let's say, um, TH, okay? TH turns out is some rotation of space, okay? Every rotation of three-dimensional space actually has an axis of rotation because it always has an, eigen, uh, an eigenvalue of one somewhere. So if you perform TH, and it turns out it's a rotation about an irrational angle. By irrational angle, I mean some irrational multiple of 2 pi. So that means if I do TH and then TH and then TH and then TH and then TH, I can repeat this as many times as I want but I'm never going to get back to exactly the identity, okay? So I'm rotating basically around some axis by an irrational angle, and if I do that often enough, I can approximate some arbitrary angle as close as I want, okay? And of course, when you can do that about two different axes, then it's already dense in all the, in all the rotations. So, that's, so the, that's the universality of the Clifford plus T gate set. In the same way that and, or, and not are universal for Boolean circuits, Clifford plus T is universal for for quantum circuits, but it's only up to epsilon, okay? You can't actually, you know, because you only have countably many things in that group. But up to epsilon, it's, it's universal, okay? So, in fact, I said H, S, and T, but it's much more convenient for our purposes to use just, uh, uh, so these are 90 degree rotations and 45 degree rotations about the two different axes. By the way, when you do the error, I just sort of explained, when you do the error correction, doing an error corrected Clifford gate is really cheap because you just have to do, say, seven separate Clifford gates, one on each physical qubit, but doing an error corrected T gate is really, really expensive. A T gate is approximately a thousand times more uh, costly to perform than a Clifford gate. So for the purpose of counting, you know, measuring the sizes of, of our circuits or the length of our quantum operations, we're always going to take the T count as a measure. Basically, we're going to regard Clifford gates as free and T gates as, you know, some unit cost. And the synthesis, so I, I, I just mentioned to you that this group is dense in the group of all rotations of three-dimensional space. The synthesis problem is basically an, find an algorithm that witnesses this density. In other words, um, well, th there's two versions. The first version is called exact synthesis. <coughs> Here I'm giving you a three by three matrix, which I'm telling you is actually a member of this group. And then I'm asking you to decompose it into, into a word like SHT, SHT, HT, SHT, okay? Um, that's exact synthesis if, if the operator can actually be decomposed exactly. So that's not up to epsilon, but actually on the nose. 
and more important is the approximate synthesis problem where you're given some arbitrary rotation of three-dimensional space by any angle, you know, any axis whatsoever, and you're given an epsilon, and now you have to find some word in these generators that brings you within that epsilon of the given operator, okay? So that's the approximate synthesis problem. Now, here's a, I was supposed to give some historical remarks, okay? So here's sort of a brief history of, the, and a very, very incomplete history, I'm afraid, of, of this problem. So basically, uh, back in the 80s, some mathematicians, Lubatsky, Phillips, and Sarnak, proved um, that there always exists a word whose length is on the order of log of one over epsilon. So what's log of one over epsilon, right? That's basically the number of digits of precision that you need. So the word that you need to construct uh, that, by the way, that's also a lower bound, okay? So you cannot, uh, on average, do any better than O of log 1 over epsilon. So they showed that actually sh very short words, for example, in this Clifford plus T set, always exist to approximate any given thing up to epsilon. But the proof that they had in the 80s is completely non-constructive. So there is no algorithm. In fact, the proof, I believe, the pr so the proof um, uses the some really deep mathematics, okay? The spectral gap of some HECA operator on whatever. Uh, it, I mean, it uses, um, I think, both the Riemann hypothesis and some Ramanujan stuff. So it's, it's like really, really serious mathematics to even prove that short words exist that give, get you, you know, within the given epsilon. And there's no algorithm. And in fact, up to 2012, the state of the art for an algorithm for this problem was the so-called solovey kitayev algorithm, which was something that uh, uh, was written down, it was uh, invented separately by Solovey and Kitayev in, in the mid-90s. And, um, but this algorithm is not of, the, it, it, the length of the words that you get is significantly longer than the one that's uh, predicted, you know, by Lubatsky and, and, and uh, Phillips and Sarnak. So the, this is log to the C of one over epsilon, where C, I believe, is 3.97 or something like that. Or you can fiddle around with the proof and make different trade-offs, you, but you, you can get you know, some C. C is always going to be greater than 3. And in fact, for the 17 years from 95 to 2012, occasionally some paper came out where people had reduced the C from 3 to 2.67 and then maybe 2.3. So you could actually, um, it was long, it was for, for this whole time, it was an open problem whether C can actually be reduced to one by an actual algorithm, right, as opposed to a non-constructive sort of result. Interestingly, the problem, during these 17 years, the problem was considered extremely difficult. It was so difficult that some people actually proposed to to, some people actually invented a cryptographic algorithm whose security was going to be based on the difficulty of this problem, the problem of finding short words, okay? And um, so Charles Gorin and Lauder uh, proposed such a cryptographic hash algorithm in 2008, and then after they published it, they immediately broke their own algorithm and showed that it was not actually secure. And, but so in fact, um, the algorithm, the, so the family of algorithms that I'm going to tell you about today this 2008 one, when they broke the cryptographic hash, that was actually the first. Um, that was actually the first time they solved this problem, but they didn't do it exactly in the setting, you know, of, 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 of uh, rotations of space. Instead of the real numbers and the complex numbers, they used some other kind of rings, like periodic numbers and so on. So they proved an analogous thing when they broke the cryptographic uh, algorithm. In, fa in effect, they showed already in 2008 that there is an algorithm for finding short words, but no one realized. So that's what they had done. And then in 2012, um, we actually started applying, you know, rediscovering and applying these number theoretic algorithms. So, so I'm emphasizing number theory because the solovey kitayev algorithm I was just telling you about is based on geometric ideas. When you think of rotations of three-dimensional space, it's extremely difficult not to think geometrically, right? You imagine you have some kind of a baseball in your hand, uh, and you're rotating it, okay, and you, you sort of want to approximate certain things, you start doing spherical geometry. 
And uh, so, jump, you know, and, and in general, good algorithms come from good kind of mathematics. So here, this algorithm came from geometry, and now the new class of algorithms comes from algebraic number theory. So I want to tell you about the new class of algorithms today, but let me just tell you what the main idea of the Soloway-Kitaev algorithm was. You know, just to get you primed on how you sort of, how, how the geometric thinking actually works. It's based on a very simple idea. So imagine I'm standing somewhere on the surface of the Earth, okay, facing north, and now I'm going to walk one meter north, okay, and then one meter east, and then one meter south, and then one meter west. Okay, question? Did I arrive at exactly the same point that I started? Okay, I see one, two people shaking their heads. Not exactly at the same point, because the Earth is actually curved, right? I mean, this is the idealized uh, Earth that's curved everywhere, right? So this floor is also slightly curved. In fact, I arrive very, very close to the point that I started with, but not exactly, okay? I'm gonna be a little bit off because the, uh, when I'm one meter closer to the North Pole, then one meter east is different. It's a different number of degrees as when I'm one meter further from the North Pole. You can also figure out if there's any places on the Earth where that's not actually true. Um, and moreover, uh, the error, so how far my starting point is from my end point, is proportional to the area of this little square that I walk. So if I go two meters north and then two meters east and then two meters south and then two meters west, then I actually end four, on, you know, approximately four times as far, you know, my error will be four times greater than if I just do one meter, okay? So that means, so imagine now that you're on some manifold on a surface basically, some generalized surface, and you're walking some epsilon in one direction, epsilon in this direction, epsilon in that direction, and epsilon in this direction, then the actual distance that you've walked is approximately epsilon squared, okay? This is the basic idea of the solovey kataev algorithm. The basic idea is if you already know how to approximate stuff up to epsilon, then this little trick, A, B, A inverse, B inverse, tells you how to approximate stuff up to epsilon squared. And then you keep iterating that, and you next, you know, then you know how to approximate stuff up to epsilon squared, you square it again. Each time you repeat this trick, you sort of double the number of digits of accuracy of something. You have to work out the details, you know, like in, in the, right, I mean, but this is the basic idea of the algorithm. But in fact, every time I've doubled the number of digits, I've also quadrupled the length of the word. And quadrupled is not quite right, so if you do it carefully, you, f you figure out you actually have to do C, A, B, A, inverse, B, inverse, because you want to go somewhere and then approximate it up to epsilon. So every time you double the number of digits, you, you multiply the length of the word by five, and you can figure out that the word is going to be polynomially longer than it should be because of that. And that's essentially why the C in what, what the C, the power C in the Solvay-Kataev algorithm comes from. Um, okay, so number theoretic algorithms. So here, here's just here's a, here's the. Uh, the Here's how the Solvay-Kataev algorithm actually performs if you want to approximate stuff up to various epsilon, just to give you some, just to put some numbers on this formula, right? And the lower bound is something much smaller, as you can see. All right, so from now on, I will not basically talk about quantum computing at all. I'll talk about, but a little bit about, you know, orthogonal transformations of space and some number theory. So let's do some fun number theory first really classic number theory. In fact, Fermat's theorem on the sums of two squares. It's as classic as it can get. Fermat published this theorem in 1754, I believe. And it's the answer to the question, which integers can be written as a sum of two squares? For example, five is equal to four plus one, okay? Uh, 13 is equal to nine plus four. But seven, on the other hand, cannot be written as a sum of two squares, and neither can 21. Okay. Well, uh, we can start. Um, we can start with some simple observations. If n and m are numbers, each of which can be written as a sum of two squares, then n times m can be written as the sum of two squares. Do you see this immediately? Probably not. But you could do a calculation on an envelope and come up with a formula. Uh, you know, for for the for the thing. But it turns out it's actually much easier if we think about complex numbers. So 
if a and b are integers, then a squared plus b squared is equal to a plus bi times a minus bi, right? And when you write it in this form, it's then immediately obvious that if two numbers are of this form, then their product is of this form, right? Because the each, each, you know, if you write t for the complex number, then uh, n times m is just a product of products and therefore itself a product, basically, of a number and its complex conjugate. Of course, a and b are integers, right? So these are the Gaussian integers that I'm talking about. Complex numbers of the form a plus bi, where a and b are integers. And so the first lesson of number theory is we learn a lot more about the integers by moving to a bigger ring, for example, the Gaussian integers. It's easier to see what the formulas are. Um, what about the converse? Is it also true that if n times m can be written as a sum of two squares, then n and m separately can be written as a sum of two squares? Uh, the answer is no, in general. Uh, for example, 49 can be written as 0 plus 49, but 7, we already saw, cannot be written as a sum of two squares, right? But if n and m are relatively prime, meaning they do not have any prime <coughs> factors in common, then it's true, okay? If n and m are relatively prime and n times m has this property, then, do, then so do n and m. How do you see this? Uh, well, here's, here's basically, here's the proof, okay? So suppose n times m can be written as a sum of two squares. So we already know that we should look at the Gaussian integers and we should write it in this form. Then basically what you do is you look at the prime, so it turns out the Gaussian integers are a Euclidean domain. That means in the Gaussian integers, you can take greatest common divisors and least common multiples. So you can compute uh, division with remainder and you can take greatest common divisors in, in the Gaussian integers, just like in the ordinary integers. And that also means that in the Gaussian integers, every Gaussian integer uniquely factors into a product of Gaussian primes, okay? Just like every ordinary integer factors into a product of ordinary primes, uniquely. So basically, you look at the prime decomposition of n times m in the Gaussian integers, and you find out that each of these primes either goes into this factor or into this factor, and that's basically the, the whole idea of the proof. So you take the greatest common divisor of n and a plus bi, and the greatest common divisor of m and a plus bi, and then the easy argument about the prime factorization shows that both n and m have separately been written <coughs> as a Gaussian integer times its conjugate. So the second lesson of number theory is that it's really useful when the, when the rings that we're looking at are Euclidean domains so that we can do greatest common divisors in them. Okay, prime factorizations. So because of these two properties, it follows that to decide whether a given integer uh, can be written as a sum of two primes or not, it's a, uh, as a sum of two squares or not, <laughs> sorry, it's sufficient to consider when the integer is a prime, right? Because when it's not a prime, I can just write it as a product as before. Okay, and, and answer the question separately for each of the factors. So which primes can be written as a sum of two squares? Well, here's a list of the first, uh, first 20 primes, all right? Two and five and 13, for example, can be written as a sum of two squares, but no matter how hard you try, 19 or 11 cannot, okay? So what is the pattern here? This is the pattern that Fermat um, recognized. You have to look at at your numbers modulo <coughs> 4, okay? Look at what your primes are modulo 4. 2 is 2 modulo 4, and every other prime is odd, so it's either 3 or 1 modulo 4. And it turns out the primes that are congruent to 1 modulo 4 can be written as a sum of two squares, and the primes that are congruent to 3 modulo 4 cannot. And it's very, it's very easy to see that second part. Why can a number that's congruent to three modulo four never be written as a sum of two squares. Because every square is either a square of an even number or an odd number. If you're the square of an even number, then you're congruent to zero modulo four. And if you're a square of an odd number, then you're congruent to one modulo four. So if, so and, and, and you can't add something that's zero or one to something that's zero or one and get a three, okay? That's not possible. And the second part, um, I'm going to not give you the proof of the other one, but it's also not very difficult, okay? Again, it has to do with the, with the Gaussian <coughs> integers, and again, we use the fact that we can take greatest common divisors in there. 
Moreover, so Fermat proved this 250 years ago. Moreover, there is an efficient probabilistic algorithm to compute A and B. So if I give you a very, very large prime, you know, 10,000 digit prime that's congruent to one modulo four, I can actually efficiently compute an A and a B so that uh, N is, or P is equal to A squared plus B squared. Um, the algorithm is probabilistic, but only a little bit, okay? Um, there's something that you have to do in the algorithm which succeeds with probability exactly 50%, and then you just have to repeat it a couple times until you find the, the answer that, that you're looking for. And as a corollary, because we have this property for primes, as a corollary, um, given any n, we can efficiently decide whether n is equal to a squared plus b squared and find the a and b, provided that we have a prime factorization of n. If I have the prime factorization of n, then I can just use the previous lemmas and, uh, de you know, and just answer the question basically separately for each prime factor. If I don't have a prime factorization of n, then answering this question is probably as hard as, as finding a prime factorization of n. I, I'm not sure if that's actually a theorem or just, you know, a heuristic. I think it's probably close to being a theorem. If you can, if you can compute the answer to this question for arbitrary n, then you can also factor. So that's actually a hard problem. But once you have factored n, then, then the rest of it is an easy problem. By the way, such equations are called Diophantine equations. Uh, equations where the solutions are supposed to be integers, like this one, They're called Diophantine equations. And we're going to, and, and the, you know, basically the lesson learned is Diophantine equations are easy to solve once you know how to factor. Okay? It's not true for all Diophantine equations, but it's gonna be true for all the ones that we're going to encounter in, in my talk today. Okay, second bit of fun sort of number theory. This is uh, grid problems. So, in s so what are the Gaussian integers really? We have taken the ordinary integers and then we've added the number i, okay? And what is the number i? It's the square root of minus one. Now we could say, what happens if instead of a square root of minus one, we add another kind of square root, for example, the square root of two, okay? So consider all real numbers of the form a plus b root two, where a and b are integers. That's also a ring, uh, because you can add and subtract and multiply two such numbers, and uh, you immediately see that they're again of this form. And um, just like the complex numbers, it also has a kind of conjugation. You know how you can take the complex conjugate of a number means replace i by minus i, and if you take the square root two com complement of a number, it means replace the square root of two by negative of the square root of two, right? because minus square root of two is also a square root of two. This is actually an automorphism of the ring, meaning that it's this, this bullet operation which swaps the sign in front of the square root is compatible with addition, subtraction, and multiplication, okay? And moreover, if you take some element of this, if you take some number of this form and multiply it by its own bullet, you always get an integer, which is called the norm of alpha and is equal to a squared minus two b squared. All right, the, the set z root two, which is the set from the previous slide of integers of the form, a plus b root two, is dense in the real numbers as you can see in this picture, but I can sort of pull it apart into a, look, did you see this? Here's a dense set, but you can, you can just sort of pull it apart into a square and then it's no longer dense, okay? So each number, if I write the real number line diagonally, each point, you know, each, each point of this grid here projects onto a point on the diagonal line, and when you look at all of them, of course, it's dense. But when you look at this picture, it gives you a lot more information than this picture, right? Like, I mean, you actually see, you don't see anything in this picture because it's just black, right? So we can, in some sense, think of z root two as a discrete set rather than a continuous set, and that turns out to be very useful. And an interesting thing is, I can also take the same grid and project it onto the opposite diagonal. I get another dense subset of the real line. And um, that's exactly the, remember the bullet operation from the previous slide, which replaced square root of two by minus square root of two? Well, if you take any point here and then you pull it out into the grid and then you project it onto the other coordinate, that's exactly the same as the bullet operation because the coordinate down there would be 
a minus p root 2. And I would like to point out that this is not an even grid. This is not a square grid, right? Because the distance from here to here is 1, and the distance from here to here is square root of 2. So this would be square root of 2 plus 1, for example. All right. Uh, grid problems. So these are the kind of problems that we will have to solve. Consider the following strange thing. Give me a subset of the real numbers, like think of an interval, okay, like this green interval here. Now we're going to say the grid of the set B is the set of all those numbers of the form A plus B root 2, such that the bullet of that number is in the green set, okay? For example, um, <coughs> this number here is 1 plus square root of 2, and it's been marked because 1 minus square root of 2 is an element of the green set, okay? This number here is 2 plus square root of 2, and it's, it's been marked as being on the grid because 2 minus square root of 2 is in the green set. But then, of course, three, in, and here I have uh, 2 plus 2 root 2 and so on. So, this, so these black dots form the grid that's sort of dual to the green set. Now the green set is sort of comp the green set is compact, all right? It's an it's an interval. It's very short, but the but the the black set is always discrete. In fact, there is a minimum distance always between between these between consecutive points, and it's also infinite. And it's quasi periodic. Okay, what does quasi periodic mean? It's not quite periodic, but any if you take any if you take any interval of the black points of a finite size, then you will find infinitely many copies of that exact pattern, you know, everywhere along the set. So you've seen quasi-periodic sets before because um, these Penrose tilings, right? Roger Penrose gave these beautiful tilings with kite, oh, and there's some other things starting up. Uh, you've probably seen these, the, the kite and dagger tilings and so on. They are um, uh, in symmetries of five, okay? These are another example of quasi-periodic sets. All right. So that's what a grid is. By the way, if I make the green set bigger, then the black set also gets bigger. So that means it's just going to get more points on it. So in bigger in that sense means denser. Okay. Um, the grid problem is give me two intervals of the real numbers, a green one and a red one. And now take the grid of the green set and find Find all, the, find all the grid points of the green set that are members of the red set. Okay, so find the intersection of A with the grid of B. Or equivalently, find all the points alpha from that ring, such that alpha is in A and alpha bullet is in B. We call that a one-dimensional grid problem. And it turns out, in many cases, it's easy to solve. So let's go back to the picture that I had before of my z root 2 set, where I had um, written a on the x-axis and b on the y b root 2 on the y-axis. Then if I, have a, uh, if I have an element alpha of my ring, to say that it's in the interval a means that its projection to the diagonal is in the interval a. So that's the same as to say that the point lies somewhere between these two co-diagonal lines. So, so the, the requirement that a plus b root 2 is, an, is a member of the set a just means that the point has to lie between two parallel lines. And the requirement that the element is a, that the, the requirement that a bullet is, an, is a member of b means that the point has to lie between these two lines, okay? So finding a solution to the one-dimensional grid problem is the same as finding the points inside a skewed rectangle of this other grid, which was the, um, which was the sort of integer grid that we were looking at before. And it's clear that it's going to be easy to find such solutions, provided that the rectangle is big enough. For example, if its width and height are at least two, then you can always find a point in there, and it's very easy to do. You just compute the coordinates of this point, and you compute the coordinates of this point. That gives you an interval on the x-axis. You try every possible integer in that interval, and above that integer, you will maybe find a solution. Okay, if there is one. But there is a difficult case. Namely, if your rectangle is very, very long and very, very thin. So if the set A is, if the red set is very small and the green set is very big, then you can have the situation where you have a very long and skinny rectangle 
and it's like shooting through space on a starship and wondering if you're going to hit a star, okay? The, your trajectory is very thin and the, star, the stars are relatively far apart. So, you know, it looks like there might be a solution here, maybe, but it's not clear how we could guarantee that we would find a solution in such a set. But there is a nice sort of trick of number theory. So this is lesson three of number theory, which is use the units of the ring. What does that mean? One plus square root of two times one minus square root of two is equal to what? One plus root two times one minus root two is equal to minus one, okay? So that means that's an invertible element. That means if you multiply something by, let's call this, num this number lambda. If, if you multiply an element of this ring by lambda, then you can undo this later by sort of unmultiplying it or just multiply by the inverse of lambda, right? Which is root two minus one. So multiplication by lambda maps this entire grid here to itself. And what it also does, it turns out, when you apply it to one of these rectangles, what, it, what multiplying by lambda also does is it will shrink the rectangle in one dimension and simultaneously make it fatter in the other dimension. So let's, so the grid, the grid problem for A and B is equivalent to the grid problem for lambda times A and lambda bullet times B. Here's the, here's the animation, right? You multiply by lambda once, twice, okay? And the area of the rectangle stays the same, but you can just make the skinny part fatter and the fat part skinnier. And in the end, you have a rectangle with approximately equal proportions, and then you can already efficiently enumerate the, the solutions in there, okay? That's an interesting technique called scaling, okay? Now here, you can now see very clearly that there are exactly three solutions. One, two, three, okay? If you go back, and the, these three solutions are actually in one-to-one -one correspondence with the previous solution. So here's one, two, three. And here is one, two, three. Okay, so the scaling trick doesn't actually change your set of solutions, it just transforms your problem into one that's easier to solve. And therefore we have an algorithm for efficiently solving uh, one-dimensional grid problems, all right? Now, I'm gonna skip this, uh, I'm not going to tell you really about the two-dimensional grid problems. Let me just tell you what we just did with the set A and B on the number line. We can also do this in the plane, okay? Instead of the ring Z root two, we're going to use a different ring called Z omega, which, uh, which, is, a, uh, which is a subset of the complex numbers. <coughs> This ring Z omega is like Z root two, but it's a subset of the complex numbers instead of the real numbers. And then you can say, you know, now this time your green set and your red set will actually be set subsets of the plane. And again, they will generate certain grids. And again, we can solve, you know, we can formulate and solve the two dimensional grid problems by a very similar method that I just showed you in the one dimensional one, okay? So, uh, sorry, I wanted to, I wanted to, I, I didn't think these slides would be there. I thought I had already deleted them, all right? Okay, so let's get back to the, to the problem at hand. Now that we've done a little bit of number theory, okay? <coughs> a rotation of three-dimensional space can also be written as a matrix where you write in each, you, you basically, um, yeah, you, you can write, um, Sorry, I don't know what those, I have no idea what these betas are doing here because these are supposed to be uh, one over square root of two. I think something got messed up with my, uh, with my slides here. So you can write a rotation of three-dimensional space as a matrix, okay? And these are the matrices corresponding to 90 degree and 45 degree rotations respectively if beta is equal to one over square root of two. And uh, let's go back to the Clifford Pastee group that we were talking about. So it's generated by these uh, six matrices here. Uh, the, the connection between that and the ring I was just talking about is that every element here is of the form something divided, some integer is divided by the square root of two, okay? So um, it turns out when you multiply these matrices together, all the entries that you're going to get are going to be of this form basically a plus b root two, where a and b are integers, divided by some power of, of square root of two. And so you get a set of matrices with this property, and it's very remarkable that the converse is also true, okay? Every three by three matrix with 
that's your, every three by three orthogonal matrix whose elements are of this form is a member of the Clifford plus T group, okay? So that means we have a completely mathematical description of the Clifford plus T group now, just referring to the, to the entries of the matrix, right? Rather than referring to generators. And with this, we can go quite far. So this is the theorem, it's the if and only if. And moreover, the T count, the number of T generators that you actually need to, to, to write that matrix is exactly equal to this K here. It's exact, the smallest such K for which the number can be written in this, in this way is exactly equal to the T count, okay? So another fact is every Clifford plus T operator can be uniquely written in this form. A bunch of 45 degree rotations and then a Clifford operator at the very end. And s such that no consecutive two T sub i's are equal. So it could be, for example, Tx, Ty, Tx, Ty, Tz, but not Tx, Tx, because that would cancel out to an S, and then you could move it to the very right, okay? And it's, it's quite remarkable that this uh, normal form is also unique, okay? So that means, I showed you the picture before, right? The, the graphic of rotating stuff by 45 degrees and how it was dense. But another way to think about this same process is that you're walking around on a graph. This is an infinite regular graph. Each vertex has three neighbors, okay, labeled X, Y, and Z. And then, you know, you perform a 45 degree rotation, a 45 degree rotation, a 45 degree rotation. It corresponds to a path, to a unique path somehow on this graph. And effectively, what we've done by using these gates for the unit, for the, for the, for the rotations is, we've essentially taken a sphere and wrapped this graph here around it. Imagine taking a sphere and kind of wrapping it in this graph, okay? And if you keep doing this, you will get densely, you know, you will approximate every point. But of course, usually if you want to get to a nearby point, it's like having a bunch of railway stations that are very far apart, but dense, okay? So to get from this point to a nearby point, you might have to take a very, very long path to get there, right? And in fact, the closer you want the point to be, the longer the path that you will have to take will be. So that's why the problem was considered difficult. Okay, and now I'm going to cheat you all by um, just giving, I, I can't really give you the details of the, of the algorithm, that's not really possible, but I will give you just a flavor of it, okay? We will apply a really nasty trick that, that mathematicians apply, which is instead of orthogonal three by three matrices, I'm going to swap goals and I'm going to talk about complex two by two matrices. And then I'm just going to say that they're essentially the same thing, okay? So once we have the complex two by two matrices, we're only going to approximate diagonal ones. That means in, in our previous picture, that would correspond to rotations about the Z axis only, but by some arbitrary <coughs> angle, but only about the Z axis. If you can do three of those, then you can do an arbitrary rotation. And then we're going to approximate this by, matrix, by matrices of that form, where u and t are from a certain ring. And the strange fact is that the error only depends on u and not t. And then we get, and now I'm going to pull the fast one on you, right? It turns out that it's an easy calculation that shows for this approximation to be good, i.e. less than or equal epsilon, is equivalent to the number <coughs> u living in a certain region of the unit circle and the region takes the form of a meniscus. You've probably heard of a meniscus because it's something you have in your knee, okay? But the, the actual shape of a meniscus is what happens when you take a sphere and you just slice off a piece. So it's flat on one side and sort of curved on the other. So a two-dimensional meniscus is this kind of region here that you get by almost taking a tangent, like you're just slicing off a little piece of circle, okay? And the, and the width of this thing here is approximately epsilon squared. So it can be very, very thin. And now we have to find, and we have to now, so the, the pro, I, I'm telling you without proof that the problem of finding the, op, uh, of finding the good approximations now reduces to two things. Finding a suitable element u in this region here, that's a great problem, so we already know how to solve it. And then solving the equation that t squared plus u squared equals two to the k, which is a Diophantine equation. So we already know how to solve it. So strangely, the problem 
can be decomposed exactly into the two things I was telling you about, a grid problem and a Diophantine equation. And the reason that this works is completely magical, okay? There's, I don't know any you know, deeper reason, but it just works. And, th and then we're done, okay? We know how to do both, and therefore we are done. And now we have an algorithm which, given a rotation about the z-axis and an epsilon, and given my ability to factor Diophantine, my ability to solve Diophantine equations, which means, as I told you, we have to be able to factor integers. If I can factor integers, then I now have sort of described an algorithm that will actually not only be O of log of 1 over epsilon, as was predicted you know, already in the 80s, but it's actually optimal. So this is a really strong algorithm. Of all the possible Clifford plus T sequences that are going to get you into this epsilon ball, the algorithm will actually find the shortest one, right? Not just O of the shortest one or approximately the shortest one. It will find the very shortest one. So it cannot be any better than that, right? And that's only if I can factor, though, because I need that to solve my Diophantine equations. It turns out factoring is hard, but not really, right? Factoring is hard only in the worst case. If, if I give you, like, the 2,000-digit RSA challenge, you're not going to be able to factor that, probably. But factoring a random number is actually not that hard. If I gave you 1,000 2,000-digit numbers, okay, each chosen randomly within a certain range, then the probability that you could factor at least one of them is actually exceedingly high. In fact, the probability that one of them is a prime is already very high. So factoring, factoring any number is not, is not easy, but factoring a random number is not in general hard. So the point here is what's required for this algorithm is essentially to factor a random number because you find these candidate solutions, and if one of them you can't factor, you just move on to the next one. So, we, so, this, so these sort of number theoretic algorithms are optimal if you, if you can factor, but even if you cannot factor, they're nearly optimal, so it's O of 1 over, sorry, it's log of log of 1 over epsilon away from being optimal. So that's, that's log of log of 1 over epsilon is usually less than 30, okay? So here is what the solovey kataev algorithm does. Here's the lower bound, the shortest solution you could have for the given epsilon. And here's what the algorithm I just described actually finds when you don't have access to factoring. So you can see for small numbers, it's still optimal because 100 digit numbers are easy to factor. And when you get to larger numbers, it's off by a few, okay? So this work that I just described was done between 2012 and 2014, I would say, and this is, was sort of the first number theoretic algorithm for solving this problem for the Clifford plus T gate set, and in the years, what well, has only been two or three years, but in the, in the years since then, people have applied the same sort of idea to other gate sets other than Clifford plus T, so, so there's now a whole industry of finding similar short approximations for other kind of gates. Uh, two examples are Fibonacci gates and Clifford plus V, which are, you know, other gate sets that could be error corrected maybe one day. So this is the end. Here are some references. Oh, and I, not the very end though, because I just want to, before you all go to, to, see, to watch the debate on TV, I just want to actually show you, like when I say the algorithm is efficient, give me an angle, any angle. Sorry? 12 degrees. So that would be 12 uh, times pi over 180, right? I have to put this in quotes because it's a shell. And to, how, to what, eps let's say, let's first do this to 50 decimal digits, okay? So here's the operator. That was efficient. Epsilon is equal to 10 to the minus of 50. That's your actual angle. And this is the actual operator expressed in terms of S, H, and T, and maybe a Clifford operator at the end, okay? Now, th this algorithm can go up to 10 to the minus 2,000, and it would still give you the answer in less than an hour, and that's not even a supercomputer. That's just this laptop here, right? So that's just the, they say the proof is in the pudding, right? These algorithms are fantastically fast, and, um, uh, and you can even see the, uh, it, you can ask it to actually show you the matrix, like 
that, that's the actual matrix, of course, written with some incredibly large integers in it. But the, it will also compute the actual error, which in this case was 0 0.98 blah, blah, blah times 10 to the minus 50. So we ask for the error to be less than 1 times 10 to the minus 50. And, it, and then it computes the error sort of after the fact, right, to make sure there wasn't some bug in the algorithm. So, so anyway, on this note, I will send you all off and see if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Ah, yes. Uh, so I remember that our algorithm factored into two pieces. First, I had to solve a grid problem for as small as possible k so that the t count would be smallest. And then I had to solve a Diophantine equation. To solve the Diophantine equation, I have some incredibly large integer, and I'm <coughs> going to have to try to factor it. Uh, it turns out I try to factor it not very hard because in, in some, it's often more efficient to just move on to the next integer than spending a lot of time trying to factor the one. And what this tells you is, where was it? So here, that means 19 candidates were tried. 13 of them, the algorithm could prove that the Diophantine equation didn't have a solution. So it was able to factor the integer, but unfortunately there was no solution. Five of them timed out. So it couldn't tell if the Diophantine equation had a solution or not because it couldn't factor the integer. And one succeeded, and when that happens, then you have, then you have an answer. So if the, number, if the number timed out is equal to zero, then you probably have found the shortest solution. If the number timed out is five, then the solution that you have found might be the sixth optimal solution in the worst case. There could at most be five better solutions. So, so in fact, not only do you get close to within optimal, but you actually sort of know how close to within optimal you got. Yes? Yep. So uh, on the numbers up to 10 to the n, there's approximately one in n of them is prime. The largest prime factor could be uh, at, well, the number could be prime. No, it's if it's not prime, so the smallest prime factor, no, I'm not sure what you're asking. So, sorry, you, you I mean, So usually what happens is that you find a couple of small factors, two, three, five, you know, those are pretty common. And then after you remove those, either the rest of your number is prime or else you just give up and move on to the next number. That turns out to be, actually, in, in effect, we find factors up to, up to about 100 digits because it's easy to find those with, with some uh, polar row method or something. But if we, so we find all the factors up to 100 digits, and if we're lucky enough, then the rest, of the, the rest of the number will just be one large prime. And in fact, if it's not, then we're in one of those cases where it's gonna be timed out. Yes? So, is, it, so we're, is this correct to say we're approximately solving the grid problem with a short number of quantities? So how, how is this grid uh, problem like related then to like the closest vector problem in that sense? So finding the closest vector on some arbitrary integer lattice is a hard problem. But finding the intersection of an integer lattice and a convex set turns out not to be a hard problem. So by, the, by, the, by a similar scaling trip, trick as the one I've shown you, you can always map the integer lattice to itself in such a way that your convex set gets appropriately fat. And once, so once you have a ball in the convex set, then it's easy to find the solutions. So that's basically the famous LLL, Lenstra, Lenstra and something algorithm. I forgot what the third L stands for. I think two of them are Lenstra's, right? Lovax, Lenstra, Lovax, and I think again Lenstra, right? 
uh, so it allows you to find, that's actually effectively what we're using here, finding the intersection of a convex set and an integer grid. The, the, the difficult part is when the origin is not an element of your set. The, sorry, the difficult part is when the origin is an element of your set because then you can't prove it's the only one. Yes? Yes. So, yeah. So, the question is, I'm just repeating it because it's not being recorded. I should have repeated you raised this question too. <laughs> the question is, uh, what happens with multiple qubits? And the answer is, there's already a method where you can, there's already a method of taking any unitary operator on n qubits and decomposing it quite efficiently just into C naught gates and single qubit operators. So if you know how to approximate single qubit operators up to epsilon over n, then you know how to approximate n qubit operators up to epsilon, basically. And it, it turns out there is basically not known any more clever method than what I just said. You can do more clever things, but they usually end up giving you longer circuits, so they're not so clever in the end. Yeah. Any other questions? Thank you very much.